All rise. The Department of the Reno Municipal Court is now in session. Honorable Judge William Gardner, presiding. Honorable Mr. Coughlin, good morning. Have a seat, guys. Good morning, Your Honor. Do you? 
don't mind interrupting. Well, I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm going to provide you the professional courtesy I expect you to provide to Mr. Wong and me. When I get to the end of making a record, I'm going to give you an opportunity, but we're not going to have interruption after interruption after interruption. All right? You'll be given an opportunity to address the court, Mr. Coffin, and say whatever you need to say. In the meantime, please let me finish. The motion in limine dealt with the decision of Truesdale versus State of Nevada, 129 Nevada. The advanced opinion was 20 days, April 4, 2013. It was filed uh, by the city of Turning. Judge Dilworth ultimately ruled that the defendant would be precluding, based on the truth bail decision, from making any collateral attacks on the sufficiency of the uh, protective orders. So that issue has been resolved in both cases. On August 6, 2013, there was a request filed for the submission of the defendant's outstanding motions. Then August 14, 2013, Mr. Gilbert uh, transferred the case from his department. On August 19, there was a notice of appeal filed by the defendant, and there was a response filed on September 5, 2013, in response to objections to the notice of appeal filed by the city attorney. This matter was transferred uh, randomly to in my department, I didn't ask for it, it was transferred to my department. In case, that's the record in case number 13-03913, and I will note there are some additional outstanding motions that we will deal with this morning in that case. In case number 13-CR-03914, on February 8, 2013, Mr. Coffin was arrested by the Reno Police Department charged with a felony in the Reno Justice Court for the aid of crime prosecution. The case was transferred to the Reno City Attorney. On March 5, 2013, this court approved the summons and issued the summons on March 6. The criminal complaint was filed by the City Attorney's Office, the Reno City Attorney's Office, dated February 22, 2013 alleging a violation of an extended protective order issued by the Reno Justice Court on January 4, 2013. The allegation was that a 371-page fax was sent to the State Bar on January 17, 2013, at 94.56 Boulevard by the defendant. On March 7, 2013, an amended criminal complaint was filed alleging a violation of NRS 33.350 instead of NRS 33.350. Apparently that was filed to correct a clerical error. Mr. Coffin on March 18th filed a request for documents. On March 19, 2013, again, a certificate of production of documents was filed by Veronica Lopez, Judge Howard's administrative assistant, showing a list of documents provided to Mr. Coffin at that time. On April 17, 2013, Mr. Coffin pled not guilty. The trial was set for May 22nd with the Department of 1 at a.m. Judge Dilworth on April 22nd filed an order setting the pre-trial status hearing. That hearing was set for August 14, 2013 at 1 p.m. There was a pre-trial hearing on May 13, 2013. And the issue in that, this, this case as well, addressed the Truesdell issue and collateral um, attack on the underlying uh, protective order. And Judge Dilworth ruled that it granted Mr. Wong's op motion that there would be no further consideration of any collateral tax on the Justice Court order pursuant to the Truce Bell case. We'll get that in Joseph Truce Bell versus State of Nevada, 129 Nevada, advanced opinion 20. Mr. Coffin opposed the city's motion in Lemony. Ultimately, that was decided on June 28, 2015. And the Department of One Order would said at page 2, lines 11 to 12, Mr. Coffin is barred from collaterally attacking the validity of the extended protection order in, the, in this prosecution for violating the order. On August 6, 2015, a request to submit standing motions and motion to proceed informal operas, request for audio, and 
May 3rd, 2013, hearing filed by defendant in order by D1 dated August 7th, 2013. That was the caption on the motion. On August 14th, Judge Dillon transferred this case as well. This recused himself from the case and has to be reset for trial. Mr. Coughlin, in this case, on August 19th, 2013, filed a notice of appeal. Mr. Wong filed a response and objection to the notice of appeal filed by the city attorney. That was filed on September 5th, 2013. That is where we are today. So what we're going to do today, Mr. Coughlin, I'm going to give you an opportunity to address the issues you want to address. I am going to set a trial date. I'm going to set some deadlines. I'm going to review the motions filed by Mr. Coughlin. And now, Mr. Coughlin, preliminarily, what is it you'd like to serve on the court? Yes, Your Honor. I was prevented from filing by the marshals a motion to disqualify yourself. Your Honor, it seems so. I apologize. Earlier, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you were making a record, and I was going to ask you if it would be okay if I recorded the proceedings so I could have it. No, the recordings are being preceded. Do you have any recording devices on you? Well, I believe that's a Fourth Amendment issue. Do you have any recording devices on you? Under RPC 3.5. I want him to have any recording devices. I want you to put them on the table. You're prohibited from recording these proceedings. These recordings are being preceded. I want you to put those on the table right now. Do you have any recording devices? You're ordering me to do that. I'm ordering you to do that. Yes, I am. Okay. Go ahead and put them on the table right now. I'll do that. But I will say an open refusal I would like to make, but at the risk of your marshals are glowering over me now, I'll place it on the table. There's no battery. Put it on the table. But I don't think this can record. Good. These recordings are being recorded. Given your multiple appearances in all the courts here in Washoe County, Mr. Coughlin, including this court, you know that you have access to the transcripts at a later date, so your request to record is denied. They're being recorded. Now, next, now what do you want to serve on the court? Will I have this? Will I be? Can I get a copy of the audio of this? You can get a copy of whatever you want. Same as you've always had an opportunity to get copies. No, I haven't. I haven't for months. What's the motion you'd like to make? Wouldn't give me the audio where they're attempting to disbar me now in that Judge Nash Holmes case. I couldn't get the audio for months from this court. In this case, you will have a chance at some point to get the audio of this proceeding. In the meantime, you had a motion you wanted to serve on the court or some paperwork. Go ahead and do that. Yes, and if I can just confirm, the court has indicated that the court is now assigned this case? Because it wasn't my understanding that it... I don't understand your question. So this case is now in Department 2? The two cases for the alleged violation of the restraining orders stemming from the conduct at the state bar offices are both being heard by Department 2, not by me. And that was determined when? That was determined two or three, four weeks ago. And when was I apprised of that? I don't know. So I wouldn't have been at this point. We sent you a notice to appear for your status hearing, so I'm advising you that I will be handling the trial and all the motions related to this case. Okay, so certainly when I become apprised of what judge is assigned in the case... I'm the judge. ...factors into the NRS 1.230 analysis. Okay. So if I may serve on you... Go ahead and hand that to Mr. Thompson. Only with your permission, Your Honor. May I get my permission to do that? And if I can file this in open court as well. You can. We'll file that. So why don't we... Did you make a copy for Mr. Long? I provided him a copy. Do you have a copy of Mr. Long? I do not, Your Honor. Here's what we're going to do. Mr. Long, you know you need to serve the opposing party with all documents you file in this case. Is there a reason you didn't make a copy for Mr. Long? Is there... Has that been litigated here? Or are you just assuming everything he says is true? The rules require... Do you have a proof of service that you've served your motion to disqualify Judge W. Gardner in this case? I'm going to make a copy for him. Did you indicate that you pursued the NRCP 5? You certified a copy on Mr. Long by utilizing inter-office practices and other MECON succession modalities. What does that mean? If Chief Long would like another copy, I'd be happy to give it to him. Here's what I'm going to do. I don't see... Mr. Long, have you received a copy of this? Your Honor, I have not received a copy of it. 
Here's what we're going to do. And we're going to be, uh, we're making a copy for Mr. Wong, and we'll file all these in the report right now. In the future, Mr. Kaufman, we you say put the uh, service any documents in this case must be made on the city attorney's office. Okay, let's go ahead and file and show you all the same. I'll file this all in. If I can just preserve your honor. Is that my objection? Can we get this done? Hang on. for recusal or disqualification of myself as the judge is set forth at the following link. Okay. Kaufman, anything you'd like to say in support of your motion to disqualify? Your Honor, I did not understand that you were assigned to this case. Um, I, I assume because I know you're the administrative judge in, in um, RMC, um, that upon Judge Dilworth accusing himself that I guess it was my understanding that all such matters would, would be referred to the administrative judge yourself in Department 2 for reassignment. Uh, reassignment. Right. Um, so this was this was more directed towards not you as, as presiding over the case, but you as, as reassigning the case. Well, what happens over here at the court, the case was not going to be reassigned to Judge Neff's home. She had a conflict based on the fact she testified at your bar hearing, and we felt that in this matter that we wouldn't send it to her, so it was randomly. I left two judges, myself and Judge Howard, and it was randomly assigned with a 50-50 chance, and I got it. So I didn't assign it to myself. I didn't assign it to the child. There was a random process. So that's how I ended up getting the case. And, and I just bring that up because uh, I guess to the extent I might have another opportunity to file a more um, refined motion now that I'm a better prize just today that you are now assigned to both, both of these cases? Ran, both. You were randomly assigned to both of them? Well, correct, both cases. Was it, was it, whoever got assigned to one of them was going to get both of them? That was never no Correct. Just for judicial economy or? Well, there's two different cases stemming out of different facts that allegedly occurred within a short period of time at the same location. So for matters of judicial economy and for benefit of the parties, they were obviously assigned to the same judge. So that would be yes. Okay, do you want to make, I'm going to set the trial date today, and I'm going to rule on these motions, but do you want to make uh, any uh, argument in support of your motion to disqualify me, Mr. Coughlin? I mean, you want to disqualify all the judges. Well, it's my understanding that the court must do nothing further now and must respond to this within five days by an affidavit. I'll probably go. Is there a reason you filed this today? Um, that's detailed. Here, and I'm asking therein. you why you filed it today. If you knew why, why did you wait till five minutes before the hearing? Well, I was only apprised, and, and, and I'm, I, I would prefer to let the motion speak first up, but I was only apprised that you're on these matters just just minutes ago. Well, so. the motion says motion to disqualify Judge Gardner, so you obviously knew that I was the judge because it's contained in this motion. No, what this court sent me, I believe, and I don't have it committed verbatim to memory, but it did not say you were the judge on these matters. Now, I think it said it would, 
it had been referred to the administrative judge pursuant to the recusal in it. And it was not my understanding. And Chief Wong and I actually had a conversation about this. And he indicated as well that it was not his understanding that you were assigned to these cases. Your Honor, I object to Mr. Coffin making representations, uh, you know, not under oath because he just made a representation as to what I said and I do not recall making such a statement at all. And I'm, I'm so familiar with that because I've had Chief Wong's um, associates make all sorts of statements not under oath. And they're closing arguments often, citing to Tennessee cases that are unpublished opinions and Lovins in the trespass case. That's a violation of SCR 123. All right, all right Mr. Coffin, let's stay focused. You, I don't want to be out in the left field like we typically have been. I want to focus in on this motion to disqualify. Let me take a minute. I uh, got this this morning at the record should be reflected about 9.20 a.m. It does indicate I'm the judge. Provides no basis or reference to anything except uh, NRS.1.230. Take a short recess, Mr. Wong, and have the party stand by. I'll be right back in the court. Numbers 13 CR 3913 and 13 CR 3914. We're addressing the issue of the disqualif disqualification of myself as the judge in this case, based on Mr. Coughlin's filing on September 18th of a motion to disqualify Judge Gardner. <coughs> While there's no affidavit attached as required by the statute, there's a reference to 1.230. I don't understand your motion, Mr. Coughlin, in the sense that I'm going to read into the record the following. It comes now defendant Zachary Coughlin in a good faith and not for purposes of delay declares under penalty of perjury that the basis for a recusal disqualification qualification of RMC Judge W. Gardner are set forth at the following link which due to Collins' indigency is the only means of providing the RMC Collin has with such declaration in support of his motion to disqualify Judge W. Gardner for NRS 1.230, which is timely given some of the newly discovered information therein and the legion of basis for asserting an excusable neglect basis for waiving the finding that such is not timely. And then after that is a link something. Now, NRS 1235 sets forth the procedure for disqualifying judges other than Supreme Court judges and justices. That, and that the matter of life statute requires that a party to the action pending in any court other than the Supreme Court who seeks to disqualify a judge for actual and implied bias or prejudice must file an affidavit specifying the facts upon which the disqualification is sought. In this case, there's no affidavit filed. So at this point, uh, I'm going to continue to rule on some of the issues today. Mr. Coughlin, you will be able under that statute, 1235, uh, 1A, if you file your affidavit with the court not less than 20 days before the date set for the trial, in this case, which I'm going to set today, you will be able to renew that motion and the procedure set forth in NRS 1.235 will then be followed. Um, secondly, secondly, this motion, which is not accompanied by the affidavit required by NRS 1235, paragraph 1, was not timely filed. NRS 1.235, 1B, requires that motions to disqualify an affidavit submitted in support thereof must be filed not less than three days before the date set for the hearing of any pretrial matter. So this is a pretrial status hearing, and um, this was filed this right now, so you're not in compliance with that uh, section of the statute. 
However, because I intend to set a trial today, I intend to set a trial outside the 20-day limitation, you will be free at any time within those 20 days to refile or file your affidavit with the court um, pursuant to NRS 1.230 and NRS 1.235, so you will not be uh, prejudiced by that fact, so you can redo that. Finally, NRS 1.230 paragraph 5 provides that um, that section of disqualifying judges other than Supreme Supreme Court justices does not apply to the, re to the arrangement of the calendar or the regulation of the order of business. So one of the things I'm doing today is setting the calendar so the motions to disqualify judges don't apply to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to preliminarily set the trial date, which I can do uh, clearly under NRS point, uh, 1.2305. Given the fact that you have not complied with NRS 1.235, either paragraph one or two, I will continue to uh, proceed this morning addressing some of these pretrial matters. So, first of all, we have picked some trial dates. I'm going to set aside one day for trial, and we have picked some dates. Mr. Kaufman? Is, we have to turn on that last. Go ahead. Your Honor. Uh, as far as the um, that day requirement, NRS 53.045 allows for a declaration in lieu of affidavit in the Buck Walter decision in 2008 specifically provides that um, such will suffice in this instance. Um, as to your indication that it's not timely, um, the uh, reference in this motion to newly discovered information addresses that, uh, as does the assert the excusable neglect basis um, supporting a waiver of any finding that such is not timely as detailed at the link, which due to my ind indigency, I, I would uh, hope the court would accept that. Um, well, I, I don't understand the, the link or the, the correlation between your indigency and the fact you have a link referenced in your motion rather than an actual information or facts supporting your motion. I can't I don't, I don't understand the correlation. I'm that indigent. This paper and ink is a, is a big problem. Well, that's, the extent okay. of that's odd that you were able to file with the court a 218-page document with the court on May 13, 2013, which is uh, well, support your claim of indigency with paper and ink, so I don't understand why the... Well, that, that kind of dovetails into my argument there. The court took issue with the fact that I printed multiple pages per page on this due to my um, indigency and the fact that ink and paper was in short supply, um, such that I don't believe the court said that, but in your restating the record today, you may mention of Judge Delaware saying none of those were going to be considered. No, because Judge, Delaware, Judge Delaware said some were not going to be considered, but I'm going to consider all the motions you have filed when you address these today to make sure that um, each separate motion is discussed and ruled upon today. And this wasn't noticed for that today. This hearing wasn't at all noticed as ruling on substantive matters. And this wasn't noticed as a pretrial status, uh, a pretrial status hearing at all. What do you think we're going to do here today, Mr. Coughlin? Well, you referenced how admin your administrative capacity here today somehow took it out of the purview of 1.2350. Um, no, but I, I will I, just. No, 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 I did not say that. You're not going to mischaracterize what I said. What I said was under 1.230, paragraph 5, this section, that section for disqualification is not even applied to the arrangement of the calendar. That's what I said. And that's what I meant by administrative well, You said what you meant were two different things, so I'm just clarifying the record. So I'm going to set a trial date today, and I'm going to look at some of the days we have picked. Um, this is drawn on now. The allegations allegedly occurred in this case back in January through a series of delays. The matter has not been in trial. Um, what day was the wide open day, the first one? Was that the, okay, October 29th. Mr. Long, are you available that day? Are your witnesses available that day? Mr. Long, are you available on October 29th? Your Honor, uh, for the record, uh, I will make myself available on any date chosen by the court. 
with regard to your question as to whether or not my witnesses are available that date, I would, of course, have to consult with them. All right, Mr. Coughlin, October 29th at 9 a.m., does that date work for you? Uh, I have similar indication with respect to what Chief Wong said okay. uh, as to witnesses. All right. As to me, um, I, I would uh, indicate that I object to setting the trial date. I know it seems you want to go on that, but I just don't want to wait. What do you want me to do? Uh, just not set a trial date? Is that what you would I, like I'd me like to do? I'd like you to respond. No, I'd like you to five days by after yeah. order. Here's what I'm going to do. You're not in compliance with the statute. So I'm going to set a trial date pursuant to the state law. We'll set that for October 29th at 9 a.m. There will be a trial in both matters. I expect both parties to have your witnesses ready. Your Honor, if I could. Don't mean to interrupt, Your Honor. Well, you're, you're, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I do believe I have a trial in another matter. If not that week, shortly before that. Trial? What kind of trial? My own trial. For what? Uh, the Justice Court is having another uh, prosecution. That's oh, that was where the the marshal threw me over a bench. Do we? Do you know? I'm going to find out right now if that's set for trial or not. Do you know for sure that's set for the 29th of October? No, I'm not saying it's on the 29th. I don't believe it is, but I'm just saying. But what is it? Did you know the trial date? I believe it's mid October. Well, we're going to set it. Uh, I, I can take a break now and call the Justice Court. And we can figure out. We can walk right across and find out what the trial date is on that. I think it's the 14th. Okay, then we're going to set this for the 29th. Both cases. And I, I object to both cases being set at the same time. All right. The objection is noted both cases will be set for trial that day. That's 13 CR. What was the basis for your objections to Coughlin and having them both set that one day? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a two for one for the court and the city attorney. It's not a two for one for me. Um, it's prejudicial to me to have to, to try two cases at once. Uh, I object to both way? cases being randomly assigned to you in what way? any judge. Um, I know you don't want the case heard by any judge. I think you No, that's not what I said. I don't want it heard by a judge who should disqualify himself. Okay. Uh, the cases are both set for October 29th. It'll be all day. I anticipate this won't take all day. Then what I'm going to do is, a, and also by way of calendaring, it's a calendaring issue, I'm going to set some deadlines on pre-trial motions. Mr. Coughlin, that gives you, that date of October 29th, gives you plenty of time to comply with NRS 1.235-1A, which requires, and I'm reading it to the record, that any affidavits filed in support of your allegation that I am actually or impliedly biased or prejudiced against you must be filed no less than 20 days before the date set for the trial. That's the statute. Are we clear on that? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused. This is filed now, right? This is filed, but I'm... Uh, and it's a, it's a declaration, so it satisfies that. No, it's paper. not. It's a motion. It's a motion. Well, it has that. I'm not seeing anything... Uh, I see no declaration. I see no facts outlined in this motion. It's this declaration. Unfortunately, the motion don't even make sense to me. I don't understand uh, what it means uh, when it says this is, there's a legion of basis for asserting an excusable neglect for waiving any finding. I'm not sure what that well, means. Have, have you taken a look at that link? No, I haven't, Mr. Coffin. I got this about 30 minutes ago, okay. so I have not taken a look at the link. So anyway, um, the yeah. motions. In line uh, 24 says declaration. Pre-trial motions, I'm advising you on the record clearly. You have to be in compliance with 1.235, and I've given you time to file that affidavit with the court pursuant to the statute. Okay. If I can just clarify, you're, on, you're saying you're refusing to respond by affidavit to this. I didn't say that. I said, I don't think I said I'm refusing to respond to anything. Not only is your motion not timely, pursuant to NRS 1.2351B, it doesn't comply with NRS 1.2351, which I hope I've made clear for the record, because it doesn't contain an affidavit specifying the facts upon which the disqualification is sought. This, that, 
this is the declaration that satisfies an affidavit. I disagree. That's my ruling. So let's set some time deadlines as well. I'm going to set all motions that will be filed from here on in on the court as a matter of calendaring issues must be filed no later than 20 days before trial. Let's just go ahead and get that date right now so there's no question what that date is. Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Coughlin. October 29th. days before trial is uh, October 9th. I mean, the deadline for filing motions is going to be October 10th, 2013. Additionally, given the hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, of uh, pages of motions you filed previously, Mr. Coughlin, the motions will be limited by both parties no more than 10 pages. No motions by fax will be approved. They must be filed with the court and either party filing the motion must serve the other party uh, with that motion pursuant to the Valley Rule of the Civil Procedure. Is that apply to both parties? That yes, no it does. You, it applies to both parties. Yes, it does. And so, previously, the inner office mail procedures this referenced, is, is that now not going to be followed? I don't know what you're referencing or what you're talking about with the inner office mail. Uh, but the RMC allows Mr. Wong to serve and be served by email. No. Mr. Wong? That is not true. He just said that the city can be served by email. That's not true. The court serves you orders by email. I've got no, let me take, examples of that. Let me make it real clear what the parties will be doing here. On or before October 10th, 2013, all motions, pre-trial motions related to this matter will be filed with the court. They will not be allowed to be filed by fax or any other method. The party wishing to file any motions will submit a written, uh, original written copy with the court. And service uh, must be in compliance with NRI, NRI, without a rule of civil procedure, you're going to have to serve the city attorney's office, Mr. Coughlin, and um, pursuant to court rules. Can I, can I uh, be heard on that, Your Honor? Go ahead. Am, am I, I've, I've been a judge in this matter. Right? Yeah, by the, who? By Judge Dilworth. Okay. Yet the court rules allow anybody, even those who aren't indigent, to file by fax. Yet you are now telling me I, the indigent, and held to a higher standard. No, I'm saying that neither you nor Mr. Wong have not allowed any fax motions. Given your history of problems with faxing to the courts and violations, court rules, sending extra judges, hundreds, hundreds of pages. I have a I have a motion in front of me. I have several so motions. Um, your administrative board is preventing me from faxing anything. I'm not allowing you, or I'm not allowing Mr. Wong to fax any motions to the court. That's it. That's the court order. I'm, I'm you have my any, if you have any motions, you'll file them in person. Those will be filed by October 10th, 2013, and served on the opposing party. I'd ask for an opportunity to explain why that's prejudicial. No, Mr. Coffin, go ahead. Well, I'm indigent. I understand that. I have no money. I understand that. Uh, it's more difficult for me when you, you add more. Um, I'll note there's three marshals in the room right now. Uh, when you add more um, hurdles for me that I have to cross over, such as where, and you did this in the last case, and you did reference extrajudicial source rule violative materials just now in, in uh, referencing, which goes to the, the order from your sister that was a vacated order, which they're trying to disbar me now, even though she vacated her own order. So well, I don't understand what you, you, you get, you're getting way out there, Mr. Coughlin. I don't understand why uh, the, uh, we're talking about uh, whether motion should be faxed or not faxed. I think well, I mean, you, you said you wanted to hear some of the bases for this call. Okay. No, some of them are some of them relevant. No, I, want to I think that's very relevant. Right. I've made my ruling. My ruling's so you clear. don't want to hear the bases. Motions must be filed no later than October 10, 2013, if we in this for both by both parties. 
And that's going, that's like Reno RMC Rule 5D allows me to serve or, or fax. But, well, yeah, you've told me I can't. You've already right. told me that with right. your administrative order. Right. Now, further, I have until 15 days prior to trial to file pre trial motions. Yet, in this case, like in the last case, you, you've extended that out further. I've given you, you, you 20 days. Correct. I've given you 20 days. Yeah, I'm claiming that's prejudicial. Okay, I'm it's you, in, so indicative of a bias, I think. Okay, so you're claiming that uh, by giving me more time, you've got prejudice. You've you given me know, less time. I'm giving you more time. That's five less days. days. It's 20 days you have to file things. That's five days longer than the 15 days. No, it's five days less I have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Your uh, objection is noted for the record. All right, so we have a trial date set for October 29th. We have a deadline set for the pre-trial motion. Mr. Dalton is allowed to proceed under NRS 1.235 because I've given him enough time to do that. Related to these motions you have filed, uh, is there anything, uh, Mr. Wong or Mr. Kaufman, related to the trial date? I only have a question regarding the uh, motions, Your Honor. You indicated that. Let, let me interrupt. Let, before you, let me interrupt and, and note that this case has been pending in the court now. Mr. Kaufman has made some allegations and doesn't have enough time. This case has been pending in the court. Mr. Coffin entered his not guilty plea on April 17th, so we're almost, well, today's the 18th, we're uh, five months into this case, so parties have been given five months to file motions, and I know Mr. Coffin filed numerous motions in this case, which have not been resolved by ruling, correct? Well, I I'm a little unclear on whether the courts said they're filed or I'm sorry. struck them from the record or said they aren't filed. It's always kind of difficult to tell because the court won't respond to my request to be able to see the record. I can't get um, copies of the docket. When I try to get that, I get marshals faxing things to the state bar saying stuff about me wearing pajamas. Um, I would like, if I can just clarify, you're you're refusing to allow me to set forth any bases for the disqualification? Not today. You're not in compliance with the statute. You're going to be able to renew that request, but not only is your request not timely filed, it's not supported by an affidavit. So the bottom line today, and as I do calendaring items, which I think I'm repeating myself for maybe the fifth or sixth time, Mr. Kaufman, calendaring items. Uh, um, but we're doing more than that today. No, right? no, I'm setting calendaring items. I've done that in the regulation of the order of business by setting some dates. Now, I can, if you would prefer, Mr. Coughlin, I can, uh, I intend to, if I'm not disqualified or Judge Howard can rule on these numerous pre-trial motions, and let me make a record on these right now as well, to get filed with the court. And your first motion filed with the court was on May 1st, 2013, where you filed a very lengthy motion entitled, I'll read it to the record, an amended motion to quash service, motion to dismiss, motion for continuance, of arraignment, motion to compel police reports, motion to set aside finding the probable cause, notice of interlocutory appeal as the finding of probable cause, motion to vacate notice setting, <coughs> hearing, motion for continuance should trial date of 523.13 not be vacated, notice of non-service of notice setting, hearing, Motion to proceed in form of papyrus and declaration of financial condition and support thereof and motion for attorney's fees to be self-represented counsel. Motion to disqualify Reno Municipal Court, Reno City Attorney's Office, notice of NRS 178-405, mandatory stay in light of suspension of trial on 11 PR 26800. That was filed on May 1st, 2013. 
signed by you with one page with no supporting documents. On May 2nd, 2013, at 4 p.m., we filed a handwritten motion called a motion to correct filing date on May 2nd, 2013, amended supplemental motion to quash, etc. That indicates that we handled two filings to Reno Municipal Marshal Cope on May 1st, 2013. See hole punches missing, missing from May 1st, 2013. Filing in 13 CR 3914 rebuts Cope's attribution by filing the, the filing office said only one filing submitted leads accord May 1st, 2013 filing dates for that which was submitted found by with metal in 13 CR 3913 and 13 CR 3914 was a solitary page with no two hole punch signed by you. May 13, 2013 we filed a motion Dismiss a motion for continuance of arraignment, a motion to compel police reports, and then handwritten allegation that gets a motion to bifurcate the trials. And on May 13, 2001-9-01, we filed a 218-page motion in both cases, which was an amended statute of motion to quash service, motion to dismiss, motion for continuance, etc. I don't believe any of those motions have, are you aware, Mr. Wong or Mr. Coffin, we're not any of those one, two, three, four, five motions have been ruled upon by Judge Dillon? I'm not at all prepared to address those today. I was addressing those related to that. Mr. Wong? Your Honor, with regard to the May 1, 2013 motion that I have, just the first page of amended or supplemental, etc., 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 I'm not sure. I thought that that was the motion that had four pages per eight and a half by 11 that I could not read and Judge Dilworth indicated he could not read and therefore was, I don't know the legal term, but not going to be considered by the court. Well, the motion on May 1, 2013, the large part of the very lengthy motion contains four reduced, each page looks like it contains four pages of argument and pleadings. Chief Wong. And Your Honor, I'm not sure. Page copy. Thank you. Don't interrupt me, Mr. Wong. Let me finish here. So that motion that you referenced apparently contains numerous, four pages per page that have been shrunk down and interspersed in that motion is some handwritten notes from Mr. Coughlin and there's also attached to that motion orders of the docket sheet from the Reno Justice Court and Judge Pearson in case number 2, RCP 2012-006-07. So the motion contains a wide variety of 
various types of pleadings. So. And Your Honor, I do have in my file an order by Judge Dilworth filed May 6, 2013, which reads, on May 1, 2013, defense presented multiple motions with apparent proper notice of service to the City of Reno. The defense motions are accompanied by what appears to be greater than 100 pages of supporting documents. These documents are copied four pages per regular eight and a half, 11 inch page. This reduces the font on the documents to an unreadable small size. While this court took in these motions for filing, there is no practical means to read the material. Therefore, the motions are not accepted for consideration in this case. Therefore, the defendant is ordered to file full page documents for the court's consideration. And based on that, it was my understanding that the May 1st, 2013 motion uh, had been not considered. I do not have any uh, motion from the defendant whereby he um, refiled this in, in, consistent with the order uh, that he filed full page documents. And I don't know if the court has that in its file. Understanding that order, I think fairness to Mr. Coffin, while these things are extremely difficult to read, they are they are readable. It just it's very difficult to read with exceptionally small font. So I think what I am going to do is, is all motions will be considered. The parties will be given an opportunity to make argument in support of and against those motions before I rule on the motions. So. Uh, Regard those motions, while you know they're very difficult to read, Mr. Coughlin, and they don't make a lot of sense. I've read them. I've actually gone through the motions and read them myself. It took me half a day. I've read them. I need to give you the opportunity to address those issues today. I will note. Mr. Coffin made some comment about not getting documents when I referenced the certificate of protection of documents in both cases <coughs> signed by Veronica Lopez and filed with the court on May 19, 2013. She produced documents and provided the documents to Zachary Coffin. That would have been in each case a summons, a criminal complaint, an amended criminal complaint, a declaration supporting her uh, summons. Declaration of probable cause, an extended order for protection against harassment in the workplace issued by the New York Justice Court. So those documents were filed, Mr. Mr. Coughlin. Mr. Coughlin, any, any documents you have filed, you should have copies of those. And Mr. Wan, any documents you have filed, have those been served by Mr. Coughlin? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, regarding discovery, let me get back to the scheduling issue. I had a note to do that. I expect all discovery. Yes, Your Honor. Notices of witnesses were actually formally filed in the May 13th, 2013 hearing, and they should be in the court's file, and they were served on Mr. Coughlin. Okay. I have a copy of that filed on May 13th. Notice of witnesses, Mr. Coughlin. Did, did, did you recall getting a copy of that? Did I get a copy of the one Mr. Wong just referenced? Yeah, notice of witnesses in each case. It, Your Honor, if I can just put that Let me ask you, did you get a copy? I want to stay focused. Did you get a copy of that or not? Of the notice of witnesses? Yes, by all I didn't, I'd have to check my file. I, I wasn't okay. noticed that that was the purpose of this hearing today. I'm going to preserve my objection. I'm going to give you copies right now, both those to ensure that you have copies. So what we're going to do, in case number 13 CR 03914, notwithstanding the fact that Mr. Long, pursuant to the Rule 12 procedure has notified Mr. 
Kaufman with his notice of witnesses back on May 9th, 2013 by mail to 1471 East 9th Street, a copy of those notice of witnesses. I will go ahead and make a copy of this right now and deliver that to Mr. Kaufman. I also see Judge Gillis order to make 6, 2013 referencing the uh, Your Honor, oh, I don't know when I can tell. Uh, for the record, uh, I don't mistake the list. We're giving uh, I'm, the record should reflect Mr. Coffin has personally handled the notice of personally handed notice of witnesses filed May 13, 2013, by the Reno City Attorney's Office in case number 13 CR 0391. So that uh, issue is resolved. So let's take that again. And for the record, Your Honor, I have not received any notices of witnesses in either case from Mr. Coffin. Thank you, Mr. Coffin, serving pursuant to the rules of the intended quality witnesses in the case of chief, pursuant to state law, you need to notice uh, Mr. Wong, and that needs to be done at least 20 days before trial. The intended quality witnesses in the case of chief, and you comply with the statute like Mr. Wong has done. We get to the other information in the other case. can now move on and address the May 13th motion, Your Honor, if you like. Yeah, let me let me make sure Mr. Coffin has notice of the witnesses in the remaining case, Mr. Wong, before we go any further to ensure that that is not an issue. This would be case number 13, CRO, now 03913. In this case, 13 CR 303913. Mr. Long was filed with this court on May 13, 2013. Notice of witnesses, the certificate of mailing indicated that the document was served on Mr. Coffin by mail. Pursuant to the court rules on May 9, 2013. And that Discovery as well before we move on is again as a uh, administrative uh, calendar matter. All right, the record should be correct that Mr. Coughlin has been delivered a copy of the notice of witnesses filed uh, pursuant to NRS 174234. And that was filed in this court on May 13th. And that uh, was five witnesses in that case. All right. Mr. Long, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Coffin, the same question. Have you provided all discovery to Mr. Coffin as required by state law? Your Honor, the, the discovery was issue, issue was addressed uh, at the last pretrial status hearing with uh, Judge Dilworth. Um, Mr. Coffin was under the mistaken belief that we had to deliver discovery to him. I pointed out the statute to Judge Dilworth that it says just make available for inspection and copying, uh, and that was all that was required. I've done that, and actually what I've done is I've gone beyond that. I have, in fact, delivered uh, all discovery to Mr. Coughlin. Okay. Mr. Coughlin, uh, have you provided all discovery required by state law to Mr. Wong? If I can object, to Mr. Wong has not been sworn, and he's... He's sitting here okay. saying he all these need, things. He doesn't need to be sworn. Well, he I, just said I needed to be sworn. I didn't right? ask you. I, whatever Mr. Wong thinks, whatever you think, I'll make the final decision. I'm not requiring your sworn testimony, nor am I going to require the test sworn testimony of Mr. Wong for making arguments. You didn't say that when he said it, though. Mr. Coffin, no one's going to be sworn. Did you provide discovery as required by statute to Mr. Wong? Mr. Wong hasn't had anybody come down. Uh, I don't have to serve it on him. Well, I don't know how you think he's going to get it if you don't serve it well, on how him. How was I going to get it? Well, you got it, Mr. Wong. You got delivered copies, did you not, Mr. Wong? Yes. I, Mr. Coffin, I, I he said Wong. something about I made it available to him for copying. And he's indicated that you were personally served and they're given all the discovery required in this case, Mr. Wong. The statute says 
The prosecution need only make it available for inspection and copying. I have done that. I have gone beyond that with regard to defendant provision of the discovery. It does say in 174.245, the defendant shall permit the prosecuting attorney to inspect and to copy or photograph discovery. I have received no notice from Mr. Coughlin that the defense discovery is available for inspection and or copy. Mr. Coughlin, I'm going to require that any documents, other discovery materials required to be produced pursuant to NRS 174.245 be made available to Mr. Wallman by you on the later than the uh, October 10th, 2013, 5 p.m. date. Uh, are we clear on that? No, you're on. Right. Did, you did you say I had a certain one? It said made available. Made you. available. Okay. Well, he's been told they're available. Okay. Did you bring them today? Yes. It, where, it doesn't say I need to bring them today. Where is Mr. Wong going to pick those up, Mr. Coughlin? How do you come down to my office. Them? You have an office? Yeah. Where? What's your, uh, what's your it's in a fifth wheel trailer I rent for $150 a month. It's down on East 9th Street off Montello. Here's what I'm going to require. I want you to deliver to the city attorney. So now I have to do more. Now I, another thing you're adding. I'm asking, I'm ordering. I always to, have to do more. Me the indigent. Mr. Coughlin, do you have been bombarded by your sister you and you? Sit down. Sit down. And the other judges here. Sit down. Now quit interrupting me. Now you afford nobody the personal courtesies that you expect to be afforded to you. You are required to provide and serve the city attorney's office with any and all discovery related to this case pursuant to 174-245. says, sir. Um, serve the city attorney's Don't office. Drop a copy off there by October 10, 2013. Mr. Wong, uh, if you haven't done it already, and I understand you have, you're required to serve Mr. Coughlin at his address by dropping off a copy of discovery at his address. So both parties will be uh, required to do the same thing. If you've already done it, there'll be no, neither, uh, no further uh, matters that the city attorney needs to do in relation to that. Okay, so that, uh, any, for, any further on discovery, Mr. Wong? Anything you'd like to mention? No, Your Honor, but I still would like to address the May 13th I'm motion. Gonna, I'm going to get to all that. We're here. Yeah, Mr. Coughlin, any further regarding discovery? I'd just like to preserve the record of violating, I feel, right, right now. I know you're a border violating, Mr. Coughlin. Every motion seems to go against you, and I understand that the record's well preserved. All right, let's address these motions right now that have been filed. Mr. Wong, you were, I'm going to give Mr. Coughlin an opportunity to respond to what you were talking about. Which motion? I did have a personal motion. Well, you had talked about the May 1st motion. Well, I have five motions in front of me. I have five. I have one dated May, filed May 2nd, one filed May 2nd, 401, the second one filed May 2nd, 346, actually in reverse order. Motion filed May 13th and 901. Uh, motion filed May 1st at 534, which is a length, yeah, I'd say well over well over 100 pages. And then the 218 page motion filed by Mr. Coughlin on May 13th at 901. And those are the five motions um, that I, we're here to talk about. Mr. Coffin, let me ask you this. These are your motions. The motion filed on May 1st, this amended motion to quash service, motion to dismiss, et cetera, et cetera. This motion has been on file with the court for four and a half months. Is there anything else you'd like to present to the court in relation to that motion? Yes. Go ahead. On. Uh, which this is, this is this very large motion that you filed on May 1st, 2013 at 5.34 p.m. Yes, I would. I'd like to present that to the court after I get a response to my affidavit. Like to what? After I get a response to my motion to disqualify, I'd like to present that to the court. 
Okay, fair enough. Uh, what about anything you'd like to uh, supplement to your motion filed May 2nd at 3.46 p.m.? So I'm going to set all these for a hearing to address these motions uh, prior to the trial. Anything you'd have to offer in relation to that? That's an amended supplemental motion to quash service. It contains nothing, by the way. Did you, did you recall that? Do you have a copy of that? Well, I recall there being some problems with that. Uh, but it's good Mr. Powell have a copy of this. It's a copy for him and Mr. Wong. This is your own motion, which I believe you have a copy of. This one because this no. is 346. Yeah, this is the 401 one you filed at 401 p.m. This is a handwritten motion to correct filing date. Do you recall the yeah. copy of this? Yeah, that's what I was referencing earlier when you were saying, well, there's nothing on this one. Yeah. And I was saying, well, there were some problems and, then, and we had to, and I had to file that to try to correct it because. Do you have, do, a, copy, do you have a copy of this? I think I do. Yeah. I'd say copy for Mr. Coffin to make sure you get the big one of those for Mr. Long as well. Thank you. Your Honor. Earlier you referenced some, some difficulty reading this. I actually asked Judge Dilworth if I could provide a digital copy of the court. And I did to Mr. Wong for his convenience of one page per page because I recognized him. So I referenced that it was difficult to read, but it was legible and readable because I read it. Well, may I provide the court a digital copy for the court's uh, easy reading? Well, I, I have no problem reading it, so you don't need to do that. There's a well, copy. you indicated it was difficult. The difficult, yeah, but I read it. It was difficult because the size of the font. Mm -hmm. You're and saying, no, I can't provide you a digital copy? No, we have a copy already. We don't need another copy. We have a copy on file. No, another copy is not necessary. It's duplicitous in this case. But the, rec the record should re reflect that Mr. Coughlin's been served a copy of his motion to correct file on May 2nd, 2013, 401, and a copy has been given to Mr. Wong. Finally, the other issue we're going to raise, I won't rule on these today because I'm going to allow Mr. Coughlin to... Uh, to um, give him time to file his affidavit to disqualify myself. But the other motion that will be addressed at a future date is the motion filed May 13, 2013. At 901 by Mr. Coughlin. Do you have a copy of that, Mr. Wong? Yeah, I do not, and I have uh, uh, comments regarding that motion. Okay, let's go ahead and I'll allow Mr. Coughlin to respond. Your Honor, may this, is, this for the record is motion to dismiss, motion for continuance of arraignment, motion to compel police reports, and motion to bite the eight trials. Go ahead, Mr. Wong. Your Honor, I was present at the May 13th, 2013 pretrial status hearing. And this is my, as an officer of the court, I will tell you my recollection of what happened. That hearing was scheduled to begin at 9 o'clock. And Mr. Coffin was present in the courtroom. He ran out to the clerk's office, uh, filed that motion. I believe that's why it shows 9.01 a.m. Came back into the courtroom. We conducted our pretrial status hearing and the fact that he had just filed that motion uh, was brought up. And my recollection of what happened is uh, on the May 13th pretrial status hearing, it was very apparent that we were going to continue the May the May 28th trial. And my recollection is that Mr. Coughlin asked Judge 
Dilworth, um, I would like to have that motion back because I would like to uh, better organize it, make it more clear, uh, make it more specific, have uh, better citations of authority, et cetera, et cetera. And because the May 28 trial date was going to be continued, uh, I believe that uh, my recollection is Judge Dilworth said, that's fine, we're giving you the motion back. Apparently what happened, according to what I've been informed, is that Mr. Coughlin wouldn't take it back. And so that's why that document is in fact in the court's file and there is a file stamp on it. Now, in preparing for this hearing, I requested uh, from your judicial assistant um, the ability to, to review that recording. I know it was a very long hearing, two or three hours, but I was willing to listen to it. And this all occurred toward the end to see if my recollection of what occurred uh, did in fact occur, that it was uh, Mr. Coughlin requesting that the May 13th motion be given back to him, Judge uh, Dilworth granting that, and, and, and so I think that that would clarify the status of that May 13th hearing, uh, motion. Um, unfortunately, uh, my office does not have the software to run the audio. I've asked for permission from uh, the Reno City, uh, City of Reno IT department to download that software so that I can listen to that audio to confirm my recollection of what happened, but I haven't been able to do that. Do you have a copy of this motion if you want? And, and uh, for the record, I did not get a copy of the May 13, 2013 motion filed at 9.01 a.m. Never served on it. Mr. Coughlin indicated in his proof of service that he mailed that. He either faxed, emailed, dropped off at their office and placed a true copy in the mail to Alice Mormus and to John Cattley. Did you serve that on the city attorney's office, Mr. Coughlin, do you recall? Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't noticed that that was the purpose of this hearing today, so I'm not prepared to respond to that, but I do, I do find it rich that uh, Chief Wong has prosecuted me for criminal trespass where Richard Hill burglarized my home office. Well, you actually convicted me of that, and they're trying to disbar me of it now. But he burglarized my office, incident to that. You didn't want to hear it. You didn't want to hear about all this civil law stuff. But the fact is, is Nevada law, Article 4, Section 21, says it applies across the states across all the counties equally. Okay. And they have to post that, that order in like 24 hours from, from receipt. My question was if you served this motion on Mr. Wong. And the reason I'm going into all these service issues and, and this and that is but, that uh, I find it rich that this city is getting, is, is taking this stance on service. Okay, Mr. Wong. When they're not too into burglary. Mr. Cobb, let me ask you this. Did you serve this on the city, yes or no? That's a simple uh, question. Do you recall? Maybe you don't recall. I'm, I'm not even sure what you're referring to right I'm now. Referring, but I, I'm referring to your May 13th, 9, uh, May 13th, 2013 motion to dismiss, motion for continuance of arraignment, motion to compel police reports, and motion to bifurcate trials filed in 901. Could I get a copy? Could I see that? Could I get a copy well, of it? Do you not make copies of your own motions? Or is this the one he delivered to the court, Mr. Long? I don't know. I've never seen it. I have a seat, gentlemen. I'm going to make a copy of this motion. Uh, Matt, take the two copies, one from Mr. Long and Mr. one from Mr. Coffin. So any issues of service it, it, can are we, resolved. Can we just clarify, Mr. Mr. Wong is getting kind of cute here. I, Mr. Wasn't Coughlin, Mr. Coughlin, Coughlin, I want you to direct your comments to me. I want you to keep this. Have a seat. Well, he's I looking at me. I don't want you to do direct your comments, to comments to Mr. Wong. You direct them to the I court. I don't want to keep talking. I don't know why I keep participating. That's a question only you can answer, Mr. Coughlin. In the meantime, in the meantime, I have in front of me a motion, 218 pages, filed May 13, 2013, at 9:01. Again, with numerous documents per page, referenced earlier by Mr. Wong. And do you have a copy of that? I'm not making a copy of this for the party. Do you have a copy of this, Mr. Coffin? The largest motion you've had filed in the court history in this court. Do you have a copy of it? I couldn't understand. You had the papers in front of me. I couldn't understand. the largest motion in the history of the it's court. An amended or supplemental motion to quash service, motion to dismiss, motion for continuance of arraignment, motion to compel police reports, motion to set aside finding the probable cause, 
Notice of interlocutory appeal as to finding the probable cause. Motion to vacate notice setting hearing. Motion for continuance. Should trial date of May 23rd, 13 not be vacated. Notice of non-service of notice setting hearing. Motion to proceed in the form of offers and declaration of financial condition and support thereof. A motion for attorney's fees to be self-representing counsel. Motion to stall fire and see in the Reno City Attorney's Office. Notice of NRS 178405 mandatory stay in light of suspension of trial at 11 TR 26800. That's the motion you filed on May 13th of 901. Do you have a copy of that? What I said before you went into that is that you, you have the papers in front of your mouth. And when my know question is, do you have a copy of it or not? Yes, it's something enough. about the longest motion in the history okay. of it. The record should reflect Mr. Coughlin has refused to answer the question. It's unknown whether he has a copy of his own motion because he has not answered that question. Well, I think so, I have a copy of it. All right, good. Well, you do have a copy. I would think so. Okay. Well, I would always know it's your motion. Okay. Well, and I also copied uh, Mr. Wong on all of these, so I have digital proof, too, that well, he has copies of all of these. Now, he's going to want to mince words and say, was I served? It wasn't served a copy of this, Your Honor. He's going to want to go into that. He doesn't mind if people are burglarizing my law office trying to get me this far. But, I mean, you know. Those are the five motions that uh, one of the municipal court judges will rule on um, after Mr. Coughlin files his affidavit pursuant to NRS 1235. So, in fairness to you, Mr. Coughlin, those motions won't be ruled on by me today, but they'll be ruled on uh, by some judge down to free trial. That's why we gave the opportunity to supplant or uh, supplement any of those motions this morning. Mr. Wong? And um, my question is, what is my required response time to these motions, especially the ones I just became aware of and were served? So these... And, and for the record, I was unaware of the May 13, 2013 amended or supplemental motion to quash service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have two motions filed on May 2nd. Two motions, one filed on May 1st and one filed on May 13th. You can file, I'm going to give you Mr. Wong, I have been some service issues. I'm going to give you those today. I'm going to give you how much time do you need to respond to those, given the fact you're just getting some of them today. Well, the May 1st motion that uh, was withdrawn from consideration by Judge Doworth um, has multiple motions within the same document. And obviously, it's going to take me some time to address them. I, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least eight motions within the May 1st motion. It sounds like there are at least eight motions within the May 13th motion. So it is going to take me some time. I'm going to limit your response to 10 pages. Okay, and and and, you, and I wanted to ask that you had earlier indicated that ruling that uh, motions and oppositions were, were limited to ten pages. Yes. Is, uh, what about um, exhibits and documents? Because I think the court knows that Mr. Coughlin has a habit of including hundreds of pages of el alleged relevant documents. In fact, I received one today with 628 pages of documents and email. Uh, it's not a motion, but it was just an email with 628 pages of documents. So I, I would ask that based on his history of providing irrelevant documents as exhibits, that the exhibits also be limited. Would that, Mr. Coffin, you respond to that? Yes, I would. Can I, can I uh, have an opportunity to brief that? And I would ask well, that he, 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 he right have to now. put it in mode. It, in, well, see, every time I want to do something, I have to put it in writing. Oh, it's not writing. It's in writing, but it's not legible. Oh, we're not going to consider it. Chief Wong, you don't have to respond to that. Don't, I'm going to strike that. I'm going to strike that right from the record, Chief Wong. Don't even, don't even respond to that. So I would prefer that he put something in writing. And, uh, but really what it seems like is Chief Wong just doesn't like being informed of all the misconduct that his associates um, 
undertake, or of any misconduct associated with the arrest, or anything that's going to put him on notice that he's supporting perjury with respect to what his witnesses are testifying to. So, um, certainly I'd object to, to having anything ruled on substantively today. Um, I believe you said the reason you weren't going to respond to my disqualification motion is you were just sitting at administrative deadlines today. I also, really if you didn't hear me, Mr. Uh, Coffin, we've had some problem with you hearing what I've had to say in the past. Let me make it clear for about the fourth time. Not only uh, am I doing some of these issues pursuant to uh, resolving some of these issues pursuant to 1.2305 for the arrangement of the calendar and the regulation of the order of business of the court, your uh, procedure for you failed to comply with the procedure for disqualifying judges by not timely filing uh, your motion and also not by filing an affidavit. Okay. I'm just well, a little unclear on that. How, how was it not timely? Well, statute, let me read the statute. Apparently, you didn't hear me when I read this. But I didn't know you were the judge until this morning, so how could not I possibly not be three days before the date set for the hearing of any pretrial matter. Mr. Coughlin, your motion itself uh, is a motion to disqualify myself. So you obviously had some notice that I was hearing the judge. The motion also is captioned in department number two. Hearing hearing a pretrial matter or hearing an administrative deadline? No, I don't know. You filed, a, you filed your motion and it wasn't in compliance. It wasn't three days before the date set for today's hearing on any, uh, of any pretrial matter. I've given you the opportunity to refile this. So you have, you're not prejudiced. You well, it's filed. Okay, we need you're to violating the law and I'm okay, fine. Thank you. All right. Here's the deal. All motions, um, uh, with the exhibits will be limited to 10 pages. So no motions will be, uh, any motions filed in contrary to my order and say in, in excess of 10 pages will be dealt with in time by ordering the parties not to. All motions will be limited to 10 motions with the exhibits. All right. All right. Then the reset a hearing date. Mr. Long, um, I'm going to do that right now, actually, to deal with these motions. Trial is set for the 29th. The motion must be filed by the 10th. Both parties will have then days to respond to the motions. I'm not sure which motions need to be filed given how the motions have been already filed pre-trial, but I'm not going to preclude the parties from doing that. So I'm going to set a hearing. Uh, that will be on Tuesday, October 22nd. I'm going to set a hearing at uh, 9 a.m. That hearing will be set to resolve the issues raised by any and all pretrial motions. Five motions. Any other motions filed in compliance with my court order this morning? to the scheduling issues and the regulation of the order of business of the court and the management of the calendar. Do you have anything else you'd like to offer to the court? May I get a copy of the audio of this hearing, Your Honor? I believe Judge Delworth ruled that I get a copy of every hearing. We'll give him a copy of the hearing. I'll give Mr. Coffin a copy of this. As soon as we can get it as soon as possible. How do you uh, want us to get you that copy? 
email would be great. I, I, I hope that'd be easier for the court. We're, sure. we're going to make you a we're going to make you a hard copy. We'll notify you in writing that's available for pickup at the court. You can come down and pick it up. That's more difficult. That's why I prefer. Right. That's the way it's going to be. You'll come down and pick it up if you want. We're giving it to you for free. We're taking the time to do it. And I'm making sure that you can get it, so you come on down here and get it as soon as we notify you your Ninth Street address and it's ready to be picked up. You can come down can and I, pick it up. Can I have it mailed to me? Certainly. We can mail. Are you getting the information we mail to your house? I believe so. Okay, we'll mail it to you. When we get that ready, let's mail it without delay a copy of that. If you don't have it in two weeks, um, send me uh, something in writing indicating you've not got a copy. I, do. I'm, I just know the judicial resources, I think, Moving in the digital direction might cut down well, some gonna, of the cost of stamps and those digital. We're going to give you a, uh, a, a copy of it. Um, we'll absorb the cost of the mail. I appreciate it, Your Honor. Your Honor, in that regard, um, Chief Wong, who's the Chief Criminal Deputy of the Reno City Attorney's Office, has indicated that he's never used the For the Record software, he's never had occasion to listen to a hearing. Is that what he said earlier? I don't know, Mr. Collins. I want you to direct your comments to me. What would you like to say to me regarding scheduling I, issues? I can provide him a copy of that software. It comes with every every uh, uh, recording you purchase. You don't need to provide him a copy of the software. We're, we're, we've got everything set up. We've got the uh, hearing day set on the motions. I've provided copies to counsel of various items today, so I don't think that will be necessary, but I appreciate the offer. Anything further, Mr. Coughlin? You're on your question. and I'm. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, uh, I'm a little frustrated here. I do have respect for you and this court, and I, I've been up for, uh, I haven't gotten a lot of sleep last night. I didn't sleep last night. Is that a deadline? But I apologize for uh, not coming across as, as well as I would have hoped to today. Okay, no problem. I think we've got everything resolved. Mr. Wong, anything further regarding any of the pre-trial scheduling or the trial date? Yes, the, uh, there is one topic I would like to discuss, and uh, that is the issues raised in my response and objections to the notice of appeal uh, that was that we filed on September 5, 2013. In that, we ask that there be separate filings in separate cases. We ask that uh, any motions uh, be typed. Uh, we ask that uh, any motions be plain and concise in reciting the relief that's sought in the filings. Uh, any problem with that, Mr. Coughlin? I do, I will require that in each case you have separate filings in each case. So anything you file, because both cases uh, are, are they're, they're different facts alleged in the complaints. So in each, if you intend to file a motion, file one motion, uh, file the motion for the, each individual case. I don't want you filing one motion with two case numbers. Can I get two separate trial dates in that, no, in that already, line? No, we already denied that. We have one trial date set for the 29th. My order is now that you can apply by filing separate filings in separate cases. And that the motions, do you have any problem typing those motions? Yes, I do. I'm indigent. Okay, I'm going to allow, Mr. I'm going to allow you to uh, file any motions in your handwriting. Just do your best to make it clear, all right, so we can read your writing. Can I, can I file by email? No, I told you that you can't file by email. No, you can't. I've already gone over that. You're going to file it before an odd copy, and you're going to serve Mr. Wong. And you're allowed to file in handwriting. Just make it legible. Yes, sir. I didn't understand that you had addressed an email. I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful not to go back on things you've ruled on already. I understood you said faxing, so I apologize. No faxing, no emails. All your motions will be filed by dropping off a motion not in excess of 10 total pages with the court. And that's to be served. Can, I, can I mail it? What's that? Can I mail it? My. Yeah, you can mail it. Now, can I serve filings by fax on Chief Wong? No, I want those hard copy delivered to him either by mail or by hand copy. I don't want to send that Doesn't RMC Rule 5 say that I can... It does. I have a copy right here, but I'm ordering these things not to be faxed. You have a history of faxing lots of documents. Mr. Wong referenced today, you sent a 618-page email. Your motions will be filed with the court. A copy served in accordance with Nevada law in the city attorney's office, and it won't be by fax. No faxing. Well, Nevada law says the law applies equally to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Harlan. No faxing will be the court order. All right? No faxing. You know, if you fax it, I don't consider it compliance with my court order. And you referenced an email as a basis for no, I'm saying alleging that I sent voluminous faxes. You have a history of abusing um, the system with voluminous faxes. 
nonsensical faxes um, to you, both the city attorney and both to the court. So you will not be allowed to fax anything, Mr. Coffin. That's the court order. Is that an extra ju extrajudicial source from which you glean that information? Well, from my own knowledge here at the court as administrative judge of the voluminous uh, issues you have filings you have filed in the past, which has prompted uh, Judge Nash Holmes to limit your uh, faxing um, conduct with the court. So but she stayed all proceedings you, across all departments. It. Anything further, Mr. Long? No, Your Honor. Anything further, Mr. Coughlin? Yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm sorry if you made an indication to this, but aren't all proceedings in all departments stayed in this court by virtue of Judge Nash Holmes declaring uh, a competency issue in suspending the proceedings in 11 TR 26800 in 11. I'm unaware of Judge Holmes. Uh, if in fact she, uh, an issues come up, that would happen. I'm unaware of any uh, competency issue. When, when, what case number is that? Which case? 11 TR 26800. We went over this on the 410 and 58 hearings. Um, okay, well, I wasn't present at the 410 and 58. Those were in your courtroom, sir. Um, well, we referenced the day compensating. I'm going to look into that. My understanding is that you've been held competent by the district court, and you appear to be competent. So I'll look into the 26 uh, 800 issue to see if Judge Holmes has issued any order in that regard. Anything further, Mr. Wong? I have information on Judge Holmes's two outstanding cases. If you want to hear it, let's hear it all right now while we're in court. Go ahead. Oh, I object to that. It's something called the extrajudicial source rule. I know um, Chief Wong was the judge in the Rand Justice Court for seven and a half years, I would think. Mr. Coffin, direct your attention to me, not to Mr. Wong. I want I'm listening well, to you. Well, he's repeatedly to, directed his attention to me today, and you haven't to once admonished him. You've admonished me at right, nonsense. Have a seat. Mr. Wong, go ahead. I can't. The record should reflect Mr. Coffin refuses or has, or has the inability to respond to simple questions by the court. So go ahead, Mr. Wong. Your Honor, I am the Chief Deputy uh, Criminal City Attorney for the Real City Attorney's Office and dealing with Mr. Coughlin, I've had to make myself familiar with all of his cases. Uh, my understanding of the two cases uh, of Mr. Coughlin pending before Judge Holmes is that in those two cases alone, uh, she has uh, stayed the proceedings and has not issued any order of resetting the cases. It's my belief that at least one of the cases was stopped mid-trial. I'm not sure about the other, but it is my understanding that those two cases are in fact stayed in Department 3 and we're waiting for orders uh, for the resetting of the trial or the setting of the trial. It is my understanding that of course, those orders only apply to the Department 3 cases, and I'm unaware of any case law, authority, statutes, or regulations that says just because a case is stayed in one department, it, stay, it stays all the other cases in all the other departments. Mr. Coffin, you want to respond to that? Yeah, that's one set, and I've provided you this ad nauseum. Mr. Coffin, one set, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, understand. I want to hear what you have to say. I apologize, Your Honor. I understand. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, comply with, with what you're telling me to do. Uh, 178.405. Um, that does, in fact, say all proceedings in all departments must be stayed. I agree. That's what it says. I mean, you're right about that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check and see what the basis for the stay in Department 3 is. And I agree with Mr. Coughlin. If, uh, if uh, there's been an order of competency raised by one department applies to all departments. I agree with you. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Um, but I want to, do you have any basis, Mr. Coffin, as to why those cases have been stayed? Do you know, or would you just simply be offering speculative information to the court? I believe I know. Um, and this this link in here goes into this. This link is the 628 pages that Chief Wong referenced. Um, and it's, it's dense. And it's, it's been a lot of work. Um, and it goes in. What? It's dense in, in terms of it's, it's not dense like stupid, hopefully, but it's there's a lot there. Um, and it goes into a lot of that. Uh, okay, Judge Nash Holmes. Um, my question was and it call, it's a simple question, it calls for a short response. I will find out 
what the basis for those cases being stayed are. Either it's a competence issue or it's not. And uh, that will be addressed as well if uh, there's been an issue. If Judge Holmes has raised an issue as to competency, then the proceedings in this case will also be stayed. But I'll find out by checking the records in that file. And Your Honor, I think it, it might be kind of a mixed issue because she stayed the proceeding and referred it to the, the state bar. In her letter referring it, she referenced decompensating. And we, I believe we either provided or referenced this to you during the, the 410 hearing in the trespass case with Mr. Loomis here. And uh, so on one hand, one might say, well, it stayed because she referred it to the state bar. On the other hand, in the 178-405 vein, you might say it stayed because she alleged decompensating, and therein she referred it to the state bar. Further, in one of her orders, I believe her 312 order, wherein she found by clear and convincing evidence that I violated upwards of 12 different rules of professional conduct, that she, she made commentary in there, whether he has serious mental problems, something in that vein, you indicated that you had not seen those orders. I believe you were provided those orders. Um, if I was, I don't recall. On 410, and you read through them, and you said there's nothing here about the compensate. That, that may be true. I just don't have an independent recollection as I sit here right now. But I'm very well with you, in fact. I just don't recall. So. All right. All right. Trial set for October 29th at 9 a.m. Last pre-trial hearing set for October 22nd, 9 a.m. All motions to be filed, not in excess of 10 pages total by October 10th, 2013. Both parties will have 10 days to file any written responses to those motions. All motions will be <coughs> filed with the court. No faxes allowed, no emails allowed, and served on the other party. Sounds like an all discovery to be completed by October 10, 2015, and will be in recess. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Zach, the clerk's asking if you could provide an mailing address so we can verify it's been sending you the proper document. 